Welcome back to the Stephen Gillen Crime Files, guys. We've got a really explosive episode for you today of content never before heard about the Mexican Mafia, El Chapo, the American Mafia, from someone who was undercover and knows this world more than anyone else. An ex-special ATF agent, very close to the director, who has unbelievable stories to tell. You don't want to miss this one, guys. You are an unbelievable character, it has to be said. You've got an unbelievable history. We're going to bring that to wider audiences now today. Ignacio Estevan. Now, you as a special agent um, in the ATF, a very, very unbelievable world right and you was undercover you know involved in some of the most iconic cases but hidden cases that people don't know about um what was it like is the first thing i want to say we're going to go a little bit into what got you into this life but let's go raw straight away what was it like day to day to be living like that undercover ignacio yeah yeah it's uh it's challenging for sure, it's challenging for, for your family. It's challenging for yourself, and uh, you got to keep your your wits about you. Uh, and, and the kind of cases I did, I did about I would say easily 14, 15 years working undercover. And, and it wasn't just one group of people. Uh, I I did repeat violent offenders. I did you know gang members, armed drug dealers, international firearms traffickers, domestic firearms traffickers. I worked in cases. Uh, uh, home invasions, armed home invaders, where they're looking to rob a cocaine stash house that looks to be armed. So, I, you know, ATF agents have to be diverse and work a lot of different cases. This is ATF, uh, and for your audience doesn't know, it's the uh, you know the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives within the Department of Justice. I just retired last year, and uh, with 26 years of federal law enforcement, 21 with ATF, and five with Customs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy job, not for everybody, uh, because uh, you wear many hats. I was not only the undercover, but I was also the case agent. So after I'm finished doing the undercover work, I got to go back in the office and do the reports, the, the, the recordings, deal with my supervisors. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking as an, as an investigator, what's our next move? Uh, I also deal with all the property. I deal with a lot of things. So you, you, got, you got to be good at multi, multitasking. It's dangerous work. You got to keep your wits about yourself. And it, it's not easy. It's not for everybody. That's for sure. Now, this is a hidden world, and it's a world that we see uh, depicted on TV and films and all that, but both of us know, Iggy, that when you're really in the middle of that, the experience, you know, the trauma, the explosive violence, you know, the deaths, you know, all of the stuff that goes with having uh, to live a life like that, it's definitely not what people think. So look, you know, I know undercover that you had a lot to do, obviously, because of your role as a special agent, you know, in border control. You know, we're talking about some of the really big guys here, El Chapo and people like that. You know, lieutenants under them trying to smuggle a lot of firearms, big consignments of drugs into the US. You know, and that brings a lot of violence and murders. Have you got one story that sticks in your mind that, that really haunts you today? About that, yeah, it's, it's quite a few things that that, that kind of stick out. Um, obviously, when I was with uh, with Customs, I mean, we we would now it was back in the '90s, and the uh, Colombian cartels were still strong, but the Mexican cartels were, were going to gradually start getting stronger. Uh, we would seize large amounts of cocaine. I mean, insane amount of cocaine coming in from uh, South America to Miami or through the Caribbean, right? Uh, I wasn't uncommon for seeing a big container, uh, let's say a big fish, and there would be an ice pack inside, and then there'll be a kilo right next to it. And we would seize easily 800 pounds of cocaine that were going to be ripped off. So, you know, working in, with customs at Miami, uh, we would make some of the biggest seizures at that time in the country. So that really gets you. What really bothered me too, and I'll talk about some of the UC stuff, was um, seeing some of the people, the peasants, that would possibly use that I had to swallow these pellets, which is very dangerous. It takes time to full of cocaine or heroin. And they would easily have like three or four pounds inside them, right? And you know we don't catch them all. And I, and I was also good at, at catching these kind of people. And you could tell by the intel we received. And you, I became really good at that, where you can almost smell on their breath because of the latex. That, where they keep on swallowing all that because it's like in a condom, they rub it up or they have it in some sort of rubbing and then they're using some sort of sports strength to push it down. 
a lot of sometimes the guys it would leak in their stomach and they would die in the plane. Look, I've got to ask you here, you know, we'll go straight for this one is the matter of collusion here. Now I know, look, you know, it's uh, money, drugs, politics, you know, these warlords, where this stuff is, there's a lot of influence, a lot of power. This is where the violence and the death comes. It drives a lot of wars and, a, you know, a lot of coups even around the world. So, you know, wh what was your experience of that? You know, having to really fight this kind of corruption day to day, knowing that these guys had so much money, they had key people placed everywhere, that this put a really different kind of, a lot of challenging factors on what you had to do with your job. How did you deal with that? Yeah, no, it's the, the corruption is, is frustrating um, because it, you don't have an equal partner, right? And I've written about it. I've, I've done over almost uh, 50 books now. I've written in about a year since I retired. Uh, I'm between organized crime, uh, dealing with the Mexicans, uh, the, the cartels, uh, the Italian mafia, one percenters. Uh, but it, it, the corruption in Mexico, and I hate to say in Central South America, is second to none. It, it is really, really bad. And one thing I discovered in my writings and, and what you experience is, you know, once these guys have so much, I mean, they, they were talking about the Gambino crime family at its height, at its height in the 80s, was making maybe and this is according to reports, uh, maybe half a billion dollars a year, 500 million. The, the cartels corner of the Mexican government, just the Sinaloa alone, which one Chapa was, was, was running, uh, Guzman, uh, Joaquin Guzman, uh, was making anywhere between 15, 16, 18 billion a year. That's just one cartel group. So when you have that kind of money, you, you buy everyone. Uh, it, came, it came out in his trial. He, he, had, he was convicted here because he got out of way twice, not just once, but twice he escaped because the level of corruption is so bad. And the second one was so blatant, they had a mild tunnel that came underneath the jail, high security jail, right into his bathroom that he was staying into. He came down and his little motorcycle went for him where it had artificial lights, air ducts, and he went right to a place and disappeared after being a fugitive for 14 years. Are we winning the war on drugs, Stephen? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're not winning the war on drugs. That really puts into perspective what we have here with this, right? Um, now, I know that you knew some agents and there was, you know, you was really engaged in the fight against Guzman, you know, and a lot of his affiliates and different stuff like that. So how did you deal with knowing that these people was buying everyone, you're undercover, you know, it's always in the back of your mind, you're in, you know, it's life and death for you. How would you deal with knowing that you're so compromised all the time, but you would still kiss your wife and your daughter, you know, in the morning, presumably, uh, from a normal life and go towards that. How, how does that work in someone? How, how does that, you transition yourself? <clears throat> it's it's uh, years of work and patience because you can't go into that right away. You, you have to have a mentor, right? You have to learn from people and then you grow into the position. Uh, you gotta be smart about it. Obviously, I try to avoid doing that kind of work where I lived. I try to keep it at a distance so those two worlds wouldn't interact, right? That's very important. So you, you can do your undercover work. You have the, those worlds there. And you always have to be careful who you tell and what you tell to, right? Uh, it's like need to know basis. If you don't even have to know what's going on, you don't tell people what's going on, right? Loose lips sink ships, right? Uh, the less you tell people, uh, the less compromised you have to have to become. Uh, you know, after I, I did years of undercover work, and and then I promoted. I went to headquarters, like you mentioned, uh, and I was helping the uh, for directors briefings on some of the most sensitive cases, high risk cases, monitor case programs. And I was very close to number one in command for the region I was working. And I wanted to go work in Mexico because we have ATF agents also in Mexico. But I, I realized that there's too much corruption when the current administration, Lopez Obrador, with a lot of people think is a socialist, uh, want to revoke our, we did revoke our diplomatic immunity status. So as US agents, we don't have diplomatic immunity status working there. And he doesn't want us having weapons, carrying firearms. And, and his reputation has been very soft with cartels. So that's disheartening to having a neighbor who's soft like that with the cartels, knowing what they're doing to us, that's a big problem there. And they didn't even want us working really investigations in Mexico. So that's another reason why I said, no, I'm not going to Mexico. I'm not taking my family in that environment where you can get kidnapped. Americans get kidnapped all the time. Uh, agents have been killed out there, not a safe environment. So as dangerous undercover work was, I think that would have been even more dangerous uh, when you don't have an equal partner in the fight in the war against uh, drugs and, and we and we don't really we really don't it's, it's really a bad situation out there i think it's worse than ever uh at least philip Colerone at least took the battle to him but we have uh 
uh, there's allegations even in the in the chapel trial with uh, the president before uh, Peña Nieto that uh, I, I one of the witnesses Ale, said that he was willing he accepted hundred million dollar bribe from chapel to discontinue oh, the, the manhunt. So if the, the president of the nation is taking bribes from the uh, the, mo the most wanted man in the world, what chance do you have to win this war? And I have to say, look, uh, your migration into this life just to put some backstory into where you come from, what drives you forward. You know, you have a, you have a big history, you know, you studied political science, um, history, you know, you have a degree in that. So you had that academic kind of understanding well back, you know, uh, you, joined, you joined the agency uh, 2000, you know, you was in a very elite targeting force, right? You was right in the heart of where, there's a lot of drugs activity, it has to be said, all the way going back to the 80s, of course, uh, um, with, with Escobar, right? Um, uh, and the Medellin cartel. So we're talking Miami, we're talking Tampa Bay, we're talking right in the heart of it, where there was a lot of, you know, a, certainly consistent murders, certainly over cocaine. So what was that like? for you there and was you winning the war there what was it like there in miami in the worst days no it, we, we're not winning the war for sure not because it doesn't stop right and it continues we, we had case after case i always called it job security <laughs> because there's always more people and in getting involved in it they, they they see it as easy money the prices go up in value uh you know the consequences uh you know sometimes they get a slap in the wrist and sometimes it may, they may get some more federal time uh, and a lot of people, I hate to say it, uh, they see it uh, like in Scarface, right? They, I don't know if people see the movie from Scarface. comes from Cuba, right? And it's not all okay. There's a lot of good work. In my, my family is Spanish-Cuban. But you had the Marielitos, right, who came from Mariel, from the boat lift in 1980. And some were criminals, right? And, 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 and to live a good life, you have to put the hard yards in, right, Stephen? you got to work hard. And some of these guys want that easy money. I mean, I wrote a book about Chapo. It's, it's, it's going to be coming out uh, within this week or so. I've been working on it for a few weeks. El Chapo uh, Guzman, from poverty to drug lord to the supermax. That's where he's right now. He's in the highest security prison in the United States. He's there with the Unabomber. He, he is there with uh, Timothy McVeigh used to be there with the Oklahoma bombing. He was executed. Terry Nichols, co-conspirator, is there. I mean, you think of some of the worst terrorists in, in our country that attacked us. They're, they're also there. So he, he's an elite company for sure. And this time, I promise you, he's not getting out. After two escapes, he's not getting out of this one. That's Ignacio, listen, I was going to ask you that question, but you know, I, you know, I've done a lot of studies on Colorado, into the side of the mountain. Of course, a lot of people is there. This is a this is a different kind of security bill for for a different kind of prisoner, has to be said. But so you know, I can go with what you say there. That it's very unlikely that anyone, especially of high profile like that, would escape from there. But here's a question. You know, here's a question. Knowing that there's, you know, there's always another litany of people ready to uh, step into the breach with this, right? So, so this is the thing. But here's a question that people will be asking. Okay, you know, there's a lot about the American, La Cosa Nostra, the Italians. You know, we're going back to the pizza trial, uh, stuff like this in the 80s, where they was a main... Uh, yeah, 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 the pizza trial. I mean, they was a main distributor, a uh, refiner, you know, the Sicilian Mafia, certainly, of, of heroin into the United States. I know this has changed a lot now. So with all these organized crime groups that people hear about, you know, we have the Russians, you know, we have the Latin Kings, we have the street gangs, you know, we have the Mexican Mafia, we have all these different, who are the ones right here, right now, that control things? And I wrote about that in, in my books and my experiences. You know, the Italian mafia, is, like I said, is nothing what, what it used to be. I mean, they've been decimated with major racketeering cases, federal cases, right? And, and, and of course, the, the oath of not cooperating with law enforcement has gone away. These guys have turned on each other like you've never seen before. So you, you've got a head of the organizations. You know, Sammy the Bull is a perfect example against Gotti. When he ends up uh, cooperating, he was number number guy, and he puts him away for a while. So these guys all cooperate, flip against each other. They're not as strong. And a lot of the stuff has been legalized. I mean, Al Capone days, you know, you have gambling, you have prohibition, right? That's that's legal now, right? So alcohol is legal, gambling is legal, and marijuana is becoming legal in, in, in many states in this country. So it's becoming smaller. Well, who, who runs the drug rackets? Well, you, you have the cartels. So here's the question. 
yeah. knowing all these things that were prohibited once, you know, as society shifts, do you ever think that Class A drugs like this would be made legal by the federal government? And do you think that that would be a solution for all this bloodshed? And uh, it certainly is a cancer that corrodes anything that touches drugs. What do you say to that? That's the heart of, of the problem we have going on here, right? I mean, marijuana is, is getting is getting legalized for medical reasons, right? There's a medical use for it. Obviously, if, if someone has uh, issues they need it uh, with their treatment, their cancer, what, what have you, glaucoma. There's, there's reasons why people need to use uh, marijuana. Uh, heroin, cocaine, is, addiction is very, I think it will be deadly for a lot of people. It will kill them. Uh, I think what we need to do is focus, my opinion, on treatment. I think we, we win the war on drugs. Obviously, people stop using drugs, right? If, if, if the cartels will be in the drug business, no one bought their drugs, right? So I think we need treatment to help people who have an addiction to get over it at uh, early age. Because you see, unfortunately, kids using the stuff younger and younger, and that starts that addiction earlier, and that's a that's a big problem in our country. Like like these uh, warlords or these drug lords say, uh, they want to see us fall like a rotten apple. Not just America, but Europe and around the world. They they know weaponizing, and they they say it. I mean, Nicolas Maduro, he, he's a narco terrorist dictator out there in Venezuela. He's pretty much stolen the country after Hugo Chavez. You know, he's not a communist anymore. This, this guy's an narco. He's, he's been indicted in the United States and he needs to be extradited. You know, like Noriega did. He was indicted and extradited. So far, he, in, uh, Noriega, uh, Maduro has been indicted. So when he's going to be brought over, I don't know. But he needs to also go. He stole the election, too. So th these guys who used to be communists, because, you know, a lot of these places, they're not communists. Th these guys are running drugs or capitalists or making money like Putin. Putin's no, is no uh, communist either. But what do you say? What do you say when we know for a fact that you know, certain intelligence organizations, whether the end justifies the means or not, right? We know this goes on. History tells us that to drive, you know, it's like we knock one devil out and sometimes we knock five in. I mean, who's to say? But so it drives a lot of um, international weapons trade, you know, and the other, the other part of this that is worth mentioning is that, look, if it was to be legalized, then of course the tax benefits of that. But then people would say, okay, but how about I go to the dentist and I get Novocaine? It's all the same family as cocaine. It's just one is legal and we use that and that's okay. It's not stigmatized. But then we're fighting wars for cocaine, which is part of the same family. I mean, for me, we're never going to get to the solutions and ask the right questions unless we face the devil and own up and kind of not window dress stuff and have a look at where we really are with these issues. What do you think about that? I mean, it's only going to get worse, right? You know, you, you got uh, Chapo, he's sitting in the supermax, but you have other family members in the Sinaloa, they're, they're going to step up and, and willing to take the risk and keep on because it's so much money. I mean, and a lot of these guys, like he said, he came from a, a poor family. He, he, he was a son of a rancher, a farm rancher, poverty. And he, but you know what drove him, what made him unique? The guy wasn't afraid to kill. He wasn't afraid. What I, what I was reading and studying, he was not afraid to kill. And if, if you messed with his product, you messed with his prices, you messed with something, he would take care of business to make sure. So this is where you're driving violence. And, the, and these guys who move up quickly are not afraid to use a lot of violence to move up and take care of their enemies or come within. I mean, Chapel was known um, in the trial, testified to kill family members who he thought he even killed one cousin of his because he had told them that he couldn't make a meeting that he's going to be out of town. Well, Chapel saw that he was at a local park in the area. He told his team, hey, bring that guy up. He lied to me. I'm going to make an example of him, interrogate him, break him, and then execute him. So here's the real question. I mean, none of this stuff goes on. And it's, you know, it's a terrible example of what goes on in the world today. But, you know, what's the real life answer? With all the power of, you know, a, a leading nation like the U.S., for instance, what really is the answer to, um, you know, to stop this and to, 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 to boundary it so that it can be, it can be controlled? I, I think less criminalization for maybe guys who are not involved in the violence, perhaps. Guys who are more using it for their own personal use. That could help and get them the help they need. Because we really don't need to put people in prison who are using it for personal use, right? That, that's just clawing the judicial system where needs to be targeting people 
who are truly a, 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 who are truly violent and menace to society. And some of these guys, what I've seen, are violent. I used to go up. ATF is no one going up for the worst of the worst, right? Repeat violent offenders. Those people habitually need to put away. Not guys who, who's smoking some weed, snorting some coke, or are using a little bit. No, we need people who are violent. Those we have to go after. Those who have an issue, no. But violence has to be addressed because if they're not doing it in this, they'll be doing it for something else. So those who have the nature of committing violence, uh, ATF used to work. And, we, and I did a lot of cases like that. Guys who are very, very, very... And, you know, they get incarcerated and they go back, repeat violent offenders. Just, they don't stop. They, they don't learn from their mistakes. They can't. They don't want to. And uh, that keeps us. And sometimes we'll give them, you know, 15 years, then 30 years, and then life. And that's it. You know, three strikes and you're out, right? Just like they say. And, and you have to be done with them. Now, I know you've, you've written over 45 books on the subject. Go in there, guys. There's some unbelievable content in there that covers a wide range of your unbelievable uh, migration and uh, Korea, what, 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 which really is a different universe. Uh, you are the real thing. You know, I've certainly read a lot of your, you know, uh, a lot of your stuff. It's very raw content. It gets to the heart of things. And for me, I believe that the lie needs to be um, uh, shone on that in the right way. So we ask the right questions. But that is about facing up as well to our accountability so here's a question you know with organized crime migrating now you know all the different groups who's going to be the leader who's going to cause the most problems and what really simply drives this energy i mean apart from the obvious um uh, greed and power give us something else yeah no it, it's, it's it seems like right now the big boy it, it is the cartels the, the mexican cartels and they end up using a lot of the street gangs, right? The Mexican cartels operate, not just in Mexico. Uh, you know, once uh, the, the uh, Colombian cartels collapse, they have really joined forces, what used to be called the FARC, to get the Colombian cocaine. And they're distributing it directly with their teams through Central America, through Mexico, to the United States, Canada, Europe, and, uh, and around the world. And, and, and they're, like I said, they're vicious, they're bloodthirsty, uh, they, they're like El Chapo type. To, 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 to thrive, to be a drug lord in Mexico, you kill a lot. You, you, you have people that kill, you have teams of assassins, you have sicarios, and you have to kill a lot because the, it's a you know, dog eat dog world. These guys eat each other and they have no, they don't care who you are. They don't care if you're even, a, they're assassinating anybody. I mean, if you, if you challenge them, you don't give, if, if they have the bribe, you don't accept it, well then the consequence is gonna be death and you're not gonna like what's gonna come next. And not just for you, you know, the Italians, had it that if they had an issue with you, right, it'll be with you, right? The Mexicans are not like that. They're the cartels take it out on your family and they're gonna kill them in front of your family, in front of you. So they, they, they're, they're very different because they, they wanna make an example. And then because they killed you, they don't have to kill all your other family members because they think you, they're, those are gonna retaliate against them. <laughs> so their mindset is, no, we gotta wipe out this whole clan because eventually somebody will come back. That's what Chapel is known for that. So look, here's the thing, let me, let me come in there. Now I know you've certainly been in a lot of hairy situations. So we've set the scene for, for what goes on within these groups. So take us there now to one of the closest shaves that you've had where you thought that really, that is it. Give us a story, give us an example. I've dealt with also cases where you deal with uh, like armed guys who are doing armed home invasions of, of stash houses. And these, these are dangerous guys. These are guys, most criminals, you know, I talked to, done with, they like soft targets, right? But these these guys were going after guys who were protecting loads in homes that's supposed to be distributed. So the loads are being protected. They're in homes. We're meaning, we got, like I said, we have been introduced and we're looking to um, rip them off. We, we work for these guys. So we want to take them down. So th those are dangerous. And when you're meeting with an active crew, and you're, you're playing a role that you're not happy with the organization, right? And you're looking for a crew to rip them off. And these guys are actively doing this. They, they can get ugly and they can get very spicy. And you mean with these guys, because when well, time you take them down, you gotta have a SWAT team ready. And sometimes when you have the SWAT team ready, it can get really spicy and ugly. And then you take them down, you arrest these guys. And that's satisfying. Um, another example would have been, you know, something like I said, I did a lot of street, street level uh, cases. Uh, and this would be in near the Tampa area, right? And sometimes you're dealing with like rundown trailers, what have you, you're dealing with Hispanic groups and gangs and stuff. 
and you're dealing with shady people and you want people to be careful not getting ripped off getting fronted sometimes if you front your money you get ripped off right you gotta be careful because i always want to see product i wasn't the type of guy i said hey i'll go inside and get it for you let's say i'm with somebody and the guy disappears and all of a sudden you're out a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars so you want to see the product you're going to follow it all the way through. Was you bugged, technology, watched, or, you know, you was kind of really out on a limb here, like most of the time by yourself, right? Until you brought that in. Was that the way it was? You, you have a cover team out there, but they can't, they can't be too close to you, right? You, you guess, because if, if te too many cars, you say, hey, what's going on here? So they're out enough where they can hear you. I have a recorder, I have a transmitter. People can hear you, but they can't be close enough because then you get burned and what have you. So uh, this was kind of interesting here because you have a group of guys, it's a shady trailer, shady community, a lot, a lot of Hispanics, uh, gang members. And you have, and I could see in the back of the trailer, guys are still going in the trailer. And the guy said, hey, the guns are inside. Why don't you give me the money? I said, no, I don't get, I'm not giving the money. And they said, okay. And then he goes, um, uh, why don't we, we go inside? And I was like, uh, I'm not going inside, man. I go inside. I, 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 don't, I didn't tell them that I could see people in there, yeah. but I, I, I knew, I said, I'm in the truck. You got five minutes to bring me the stuff or I'm leaving because I knew what was going to happen. It's going to be lights out, right? <laughs> I was going to get shot or killed or, or what have you, get ripped off. That's that you, you have your instincts have to help protect you. You you only go so far, but if you go too far to make a deal, it could cost your life. So you got to know what boundaries and the line is. If not, you can get yourself killed uh, very easily. Uh, so the guns were never there because he makes another phone call and the, the guy shows up with the guns. Yeah. So he was lying to me. There, there was no guns in there. So that, I made the right call by not going in there. He sold me an AK-47 with a with a drum with 75 rounds in it. Uh, he sold me some crystal meth and two Glock pistols. So, you know, he put, he would rip me out of a two thousand dollar rip. He was looking for getting me back in there. Didn't happen. But after that, he respected that I had it and everything else. But if you don't have good common sense instincts, you don't learn it. You will learn quickly. So here's a question: For someone who comes from a background with being a university, you know, I know you're married. Two beautiful daughters and all that, you know. You, you know, you come a normal life, very driven, um, academic life, and then you, you go in to the ATF, a very elite unit. So, how does someone who's thrown right in there to them really life and death situations like you? How do you find it within yourself? Because there's no practice run for this. There's no school book to actually being in them situations and using your wits to get through them. How does someone like you find the smarts for that or find the skills for that apart from your training? Because they can only train you so much, right? It's a, it's a baptism by fire, Stephen. <laughs> no doubt about it. You've had to, like you said, it's not for everybody. Not everybody does undercover work. It's, you know, you're an investigator. You see work's not for everybody. Um, so it's something where I developed a niche for it. Again, I had, I didn't, I didn't look like this, obviously. Uh, I had a, a nice big beard, I had long hair. I spoke Spanish. I could speak English with an accent. Uh, I did a lot of things in favor. I had good mentors that I could study from, right? And then after you watch someone, like I said, for a few years, then you start going a little bit like baby steps, like anything else. You get more and more confident. And then when it's time, you have the experience, then you're saying, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is my story. This is what I'm about. I'm buying these guns. They're moving out of the area. Uh, <clears throat> and then you fit your story. Uh, you got to know your audience. You got to know who your target is. And you got to know what you're dealing with and what they're looking for. Once you get comfortable with all those variables, I, I think everything's in your factor. So why? Why do it? Why does someone like that with a, a normal life, a family to look after? It's got to be more than the money, right? It's just like they're paying you absolute fortunes. But why? What is the drive? Is why go out, put your life on the line? It's, it's a passion. Like I mean, once, once you get really good at it, it's still satisfying. I'll be honest with you. I, I put a lot of bad people... And, and, and it's the best kind of evidence you can for your case because I, you have the recordings, you have the video, you have the audio. I had undercover apartments. I had that wired up. So sometimes when you have people come in, you have great evidence right there showing. And, and what you want to do is present like a movie to the jury in, in the American system. You want to have the strongest evidence because you also want the prosecutor to feel confident with the case. And, and you taking these bad people off the street really makes you feel good when they get 15 years, when they get 20 years, 25 years, when they get life. And you know you're making the area safer. You're taking them off. That's satisfying a lot. It's dangerous. Sometimes you, you, you scratch your head. And the more frustrating thing is when you risk your life doing these cases, you have a bad supervisor or a poor prosecutor where you put the time in and the case doesn't get done right. That, that is frustrating. 
So you're saying in a way it's addictive. That's what you're saying. It's kind of like a buzz. You're rolling the dice. There's that kind of element to it. I get. I get. You. 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 Um, you have a goal. You know, and you have a target that you, is certainly honourable. But is there a factor of it of rolling the dice, of gambling, of sailing close to the wind? Yeah, maybe, maybe some of that. There's definitely a drilling factor. You, you do. Do uh, I do? I do enjoy being successful at doing undercover. Uh, but again, in the back of my mind, I knew I'm playing a role. Right. That, that's the key right there. I, I'm not really an armed drug dealer. Right. I am not really a guy who traffics in guns. I'm pretending to and I pretend long enough that they're comfortable with me. But at the end, who am I? I'm a guy that goes back to his family. I'm the guy who goes back and is an investigator who's putting a case together. That's the key. We have to find you can't become friends with these guys. Right. In the mind, you have to pretend. But you really don't want to become friends with them because it makes it harder because they're, they're doing something bad, and your job is there to expose it, investigate it, and put them away. And you got to always remember that. Now, I know that, you know, you've been in some of the most high-profile cases. You know, we're talking Hells Angels. We're talking big, big names, big criminal uh, syndicates here, the triads. You know, I can go on and on and on. Um, I've read a lot of the stuff. Some of these cases, they are amazing. Um, but look... The Mexican Mafia, you know, you have said, you know, we've talked about this. They're really taking over everything when it comes to driving the drug trade and certainly into the U.S. and even internationally. So what happens now in 2022 and where do they go next? And has that going to be for other criminal gangs and certainly for us other normal people in society? What's going to happen with this? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see some of these other crime syndicates, either they're just going to go away, like the mafia, the one percenters, or they're going to end up working for these cartels one way or the other, because that's where the big money is, right? If you want to make a lot of money, heroin, cocaine, it's where it's at, and they control it, right? You want to sell their product, you got to play ball with them, and they're going to bring it in. You know, just like the prison gangs, uh, La Eme, Mexican Mafia, you mentioned them earlier. They control a lot of street gangs from prison, right? They got to pay them a percentage to sell drugs in their territory. So the, the stronger these guys get, the street gangs expand, they control more. And, and they got the numbers. I mean, they, and I've seen, I've been part of good gang cases, taking down some of the worst gangs in the areas where I worked. And the gangs still flourish, they still come back. Um, yeah, we, we have to do something about the gang culture because that truly is it's going everywhere. That's not just something an American phenomenon. It's all over Canada. It's all over MS-13 started here, but they've taken over in Central America, you know, Mara Salatucha, and they're violent and vicious. And they, they, some of them are worse than the cartels because sometimes they're not about the money, which is what the cartel's about. They're about their reputation and how bloodthirsty and how vicious and nasty they are. And MS-13 is known for that. Sometimes they'll kill people because you said, oh, I killed 10. Well, I want to outbeat you. I want to kill 12. So you see that couple over there? Let's kill them. And that, that's the, the kind of mindset we're dealing with here. That, that's that's where we're going. And that's what these kind of people, we have to get off the street and hammer those guys. And we have to get these kids out of that culture. If not, that's where we're going to continue vicious cycle over and over again. Well, scary, scary things. it is a scary stuff, you know, and this is why, you know, to go over the scary stuff, you have to face it. It's not to hide it in the corner. We've took a really fascinating, really straight in dive on... Um, where the drug situation is now internationally. Now I know we're going to cover a lot of other stuff, and we're going to do some other some other interviews. And I know I'll just put a little sprinkling in there. I know that me and you are developing, uh, you know, a TV series that is it's very high profile. Watch this space for that, right? Very raw content, and it's going to explode out there. So we're going to go further into this territory. But look. Thank you very much today, you know, Iggy, for coming and putting your, your knowledge and um, your uh, uh, expertise on shedding the light and this major problem, El Chapo, all of these gangs, and we're going to come back. Thank you for coming on the, on the platform. Thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, you can see my books on Amazon under my name, Ignacio Esteban, and I think people like my autobiography, ATF Undercover. It's, it's good. It's about my back of my life. And uh, it's about the cases and also the good, the bad, and the ugly of ATF. <laughs> we talk about a lot. 
And if you like organized crime, you like uh, uh, Chapo, please feel free and read my books. They're short, they're good series, and I think you will get a lot out of it. Thank you, Stephen. And remember, people, the truth is where we ask the right questions to solve stuff. But it's a wonderful life, a beautiful life. I'm happy to say there are many beautiful people out there. Be aware. Take care, guys. See you soon.